All right, welcome to the first video in a series on the pathogens. What I would like you to do is watch these videos on the various pathogens and take notes on them. What we're going to practice in class is we're going to go through a bunch of different kinds of case studies and information that builds on this information that will help you remember it. So how is this organized? I'm going to organize it in this way. There's going to be talk about the pathogen and its properties. There'll be talk about the transmission route. I'll talk about the disease course or its symptoms. We'll then talk about the pathogen and the virus factors it uses, such as toxins, capsules, enzymes, etc., that make it a pathogen. In the case of viruses, we'll talk about its replication cycle and anything unique that it does. We will then talk about diagnosis and treatment. That's how it'll be organized. That's I will have those titles quite often with each pathogen. I suggest that you fill out the summary sheet as we go. And if I click here and I can show this to you, make a copy of this sheet and it will make it very useful for you to summarize the information that we talk about. So I really encourage you to do that. All right. These are the pathogens that we're going to cover. We're going to cover diarrheal diseases caused by E. coli, Salmonella, Enterica, and Clostridium difficile. We're going to cover Staphylococcus aureus, which causes skin infections and a number of other infections. We're going to talk about sexually transmitted diseases, chlamydia and human papillomavirus. We're going to talk about vector-borne diseases, malaria and Lyme disease. And then finally, we're going to end with some respiratory infections, rhinovirus, influenza, and <clears throat> SARS-CoV-2. Why did I pick these? Well, either they were really important in that they, they have a significant, they cause a significant disease burden, or I thought that they had an interesting feature that was worth studying. So that's why. We couldn't cover everything that is causes disease in humans. There's hundreds of diseases, but this will give you a good taste of the kind of things that are important and cause disease in humans. The first one that we're going to begin with is Escherichia coli. So pathogen and properties. E. coli has an interesting relationship with humans. It's mainly a commensal or mutualistic organism providing benefits to the host. It has great utility in scientific research. It is the model organism that is used for all sorts of investigations. Yet, when certain genetic components are added to it, it becomes a pathogen, and we'll talk about some of those. So what are the general features of this organism? It is gram-negative, non-spore-forming, short rod to avoid cell. And there's a little image here of what they look like. Optimal growth is at 37 degrees centigrade, which is your body temperature is a facultative anaerobe. It can ferment lactose to acid and it's capable of forming indole. And these two properties can be used to help identify the organism. Further serotyping can be done to differentiate strains. One of the most common strains that causes diarrheal diseases is O157H7 serotype. But there are 50 different serotypes that have been known to cause disease in humans. It's not the only one. We are going to cover one disease that E. coli causes. And there's a number of different, there's actually nine different pathifiers that cause either various diarrheal diseases and then um, cause some urinary tract infections. We are going to cover enterohemorrhagic E. coli, which is often called as EHEC. EHEC is probably the most significant E. coli infection. There are about estimated 266,000 cases each year in the United States. Incident EHEC infection has been rising. This is probably caused by large food processing plants that take in a lot of different beef from a lot of different areas. So if one of those food processing plants has a problem, it's going to affect a lot of people. This is especially true for ground meat. However, more recent cases have been linked to vegetables and raw milk products and some processed foods that have been created. The transmission route is fecal to oral, so fecal contamination will contaminate food and then 
people will consume it. So the first virulence factor or pathogenesis feature of E. coli is it has fimbriae that enhance its intestine colonizing ability. It allows adherence to the small bowel mucosa, so that the small intestines, normally commensal or mutualistic E. coli, bind to the large intestines. Not, it's not normally colonized. The small intestines are not normally colonized by E. coli. Okay, so what are the symptoms of E. coli? The typical symptoms after you ingest this organism is you will have abdominal pain and short fever, and this abdominal pain can be intense. This will then initially begin with non-bloody diarrhea, and there's vomiting in about 50% of patients. Within one to two days, the diarrhea turns bloody with increased abdominal pain, and this stage lasts four to 10 days. In most cases, the disease then subsides without further complications. However, in about 10% of cases, there is a complication, and this often occurs in young children, less than five, and the old, greater than 65. A toxin produced by the microbe escapes into the bloodstream and kills erythrocytes. These erythrocytes build up in the bloodstream, they damage blood vessels, and they'll clog up the kidneys and lead to kidney failure. And that clogging up in the kidneys causes high blood pressure because blood can't flow through as well. And that high blood pressure and damage to the kidneys causes significant hardship and can lead to death. About 4% of children with Hus die and another 12 to 30% have serious complications that can be lifelong. So Hus is a serious and big deal. Okay, so what are some of the things that E. coli does that make it such an efficient pathogen? One of them is it can do attachment and effacement. It attaches through fimbriae. And what's really interesting about it, and you can see it in this diagram here. First of all, if you look at these photos, this is like a scanning electron micrograph photo in panel A. And you can see this little pestle, pedestal belt and the E. coli bound to it. And then these other three, B, C, and D, are transmission electron micrographs that show E. coli tightly binding to the intestines. So it will first attach through fimbriae as we talked about, but then it uses a type three secretion system, T3SS, that's a type three secretion system, to translocate a receptor, the translocated intimate receptor, TIR, into the cells. This will then turn around and go to the membrane and intamin will bind to TIR. So the pathogen injects its own receptor into the host. Now it also injects a bunch of proteins that deal, cause the, the cell, host cell cytoskeleton to rearrange and make this pedestal, and then it can attach very tightly. So they form these pedestals, they bind extremely tightly. Another property, a pathogenic property that I talked about a little bit, which was the toxin when I talked about Hus, is E. coli encodes shiga toxin. It is encoded on a bacteriophage that is lysogenic for these E. coli strains, and it's in the E. coli genome. This shiga toxin is also produced by some shigella species, which is another organism that can cause diarrhea. So that's where the name comes from but it's on a prophage. So uh, it, this toxin is only produced, is produced in E. coli from this prophage, from this lysogenic bacteriophage, but there's no mechanism for secretion. So what happens is this toxin builds up inside these cells. Another issue is phase induction. Phage induction will induce expression of the toxin. And so when the phage then lyses the bacterial cell, the toxin is released. 
Okay, so the toxin is only released when cells die. So what does sugar toxin do? It is a classic AB toxin in structure. The B subunit is for binding. There's five subunits and it binds to GB3, which is global triacylceramide. And that is a glycolipid. So that's a lipid on the surface of host cells. It's abundant in cells in the intestines and the kidneys. Interestingly, cattle lack these receptors. And I'll get back to that in a second. So this toxin binds to this GB3, which is in the membrane of these cells. It then translocates in the A subunit. The A subunit attacks the ribosome and cleaves the ribosomal RNA. Right? And then that obviously screws up tran you know, translation in these cells and kills them. So cattle lack these receptors, right? And what that means is they can be reservoirs for this hemorrhagic E. coli and it doesn't affect them at all. Diagnosis and treatment of E. coli. Diagnosis is by culturing the microorganism. Serological tents against the lipopolysaccharide and the flagella are done to identify the strain. That's where the O157 H7 comes from. O is for LPS, H is for flagella, and so that's what those serological tests are doing. So there are other tests available. There is a test on the O157 antigen directly, and it will detect the microbe in stools in less than one hour. Toxin producing strains or the toxin itself can be detected in stools using serological assays. These are assays that use antibodies to detect the the toxin itself rapid detection is nice because it can lessen the chances of progression to hemolytic uremic syndrome if somebody knows you're diagnosed with the disease they can then do things you know supportive care that make sure it doesn't progress treatment is largely limited to supportive care because the one thing you don't want to do is kill the e coli strains all at once. If you prescribe antibiotics, you'll kill the strains, they'll lice, and they'll release the shiga toxin inside them, and that's dangerous. So mostly what you're restricted to is supportive care. That is the E. coli presentation.